Hello everybody, my name is Nayeli. I'm um, an ethnographer, a very passionate ethnographer, and I work for Hive, the innovation company. And today I have a very, very, very special guest speaker. And this is Professor Robert Three Kuhne. berries, thank you very much, <laughs> Nayeli. Inventor of ethnography, who just published his third book called Ethnography, the Essential Guide to Qualitative Social Media Research. So Rob, is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here at Hive headquarters in Munich, Germany. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Rob, it's your third book. Um, tell us... Third in ethnography book. That's actually my sixth book. Yeah, that, that's yeah, true. Yeah, okay. It's your third ethnography <laughs> book. Yeah. What is different in this book from mm -hmm. the other two versions? What changed from? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really been a, an evolution, uh, Nayeli, of netnography, starting from uh, a technique that I discovered and developed during my dissertation research uh, in about 1995. Uh, and have had to sort of put more meat on the bones of netnography to explain what I was doing uh, in regard to using the kind of information that was out there in the internet uh, on shared network spaces. So when I first started there was not a lot of information around. There was plenty for the kind of fan related information that I was looking for but uh, there were certain groups that were using uh, online communities uh, and a lot of people were not. Uh, as the years grew, uh, more and more people started to use uh, social media. When I started in 1995, there was, uh, you know, browsers and Usenet groups and bulletin boards, chat rooms, there were multi-user dungeons and video games and places where people were communicating in different ways, but there was not the social media uh, industry that has happened as we know it. Um, that growth in social media use and that growth in the industrialization of social media has really mean that the, the medium itself has changed. The way people have used it has changed. It's become much more of a mass medium. Uh, it's no secret to people that social media is uh, something that brands are using all the time. It's also something that uh, regular people are using all the time and it's now changed kind of the course of elections. It seems to be changing the course of society. So when I started out, this was a niche activity. I had to convince people uh, for the first 10 years of my career probably, until about 2005, so 1995 to 2005, I was developing these techniques and I was also using the techniques. So um, I was developing a toolkit so that I could understand what was going on in this space. So the short answer to, not really so short anymore, the longer <laughs> answer, the shorter end to my long answer to your question is that um, over time I've had to adapt to the fact that social media has changed. The way people use social media has changed. The medium itself has changed. And this book more than the others, but certainly uh, it's been an evolutionary process, particularly from the first book to the second when I really redefined netnography, to this one where, where I've um, systematized netnography. So in this book, which as you mentioned is subtitled um, The Essential Guide to Qualitative Social Media Research, I, I make the jump from netnography being a method that has really been allied in the past with ethnography and anthropology to a ethnography, uh, a, a, a netnography that is sort of cut free of its, of its traditional roots in anthropology uh, and ethnography and is more aligned with um, qualitative research in general using social media data and social media kinds of topics as its focus. And so that's really been the, I, I think, very liberating and very freeing moment with ethnography. Uh, and this book has allowed me to really systematize the method as never before. I would say that the second book was quite philosophical. The first book was really setting the grounds, and this book is very much more of a specific guidebook on how to do netnography as a, as a scientific method, as a rigorous scientific method that's made up of a number of different sort of sub-operations that end up being tools that, in, that researchers can take and solve particular problems in, in fairly unique and different ways. It's a very flexible set of tools now. Whereas before it was really more of a, uh, you know, a set of concepts with some more general guidelines. Okay.
okay. That's a long answer, I know. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can go. I can go longer if you want. <laughs> yeah. Good. Rob, in our last conversations, yeah. and also in your book, you refer to a term called deep data. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what are deep data and how relevant are they to ethnography? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so deep data is is uh, my term for the kinds of online traces that people find while they're doing ethnography that are uh, richly revealing of the cultural realities of topics that the researcher is interested in. So when we're conducting uh, ethnographic research, we're looking at online traces and we're deciding which of those online traces might help us to answer some question, solve some problem. In your case, you, you work for Hive and you're trying to solve clients' problems. So they, they come to you with particular business problems. In, in, you know, in my normal research career, I might be curious about something such as uh, you know, how, do, how do people talk about utopia using uh, social media today? Or how might we solve uh, some of the stuck areas around the, the climate crisis that we're all facing on this planet right now through uh, understanding better how people are discussing and maybe some of the antagonism and debate that's happening uh, online around these topics. Um, and so whichever topic we're coming curious to the, uh, the world of social media for, there are going to be certain people who are posting certain traces that can be particularly intriguing or revealing of deeper cultural trends uh, and realities. And I call these particular kinds of, these particular instances of, of coming up with these online traces, when we collect them, they become deep data. And that deep data is something that uh, ends up being sort of uh, very revealing for us because we can interpret it in a way that has a lot of layers, like, like peeling an onion, where we're, we're, we find a lot that's, that's rich in there. Uh, and and it's, uh, uh, it's also, um, very valuable for us because when we present it to other people, you to clients or me to, to people who are reading my articles, the, they, they get a real sense of, of, ah, now I understand this is sort of, this is a, 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 a piece of data that really captures some of the core insights uh, that, that uh, this person is trying to relate to me. Mm -hmm. So deep data are, are these sort of, they're, they're hard to find, they're these gems, but when you find them, they're, they're, they're very meaningful and very revealing. Mm -hmm. So deep data are from nature qualitative? They're always qualitative, but they can be, they can be photographs, they can be videos, they can be uh, images that people draw, they can be memes, um, or they can be you know, generally fairly long and detailed texts. Mm -hmm. Some of the best deep data that I uh, like to work with is stories. People tell amazing stories online, and these yeah. stories have you know, rich beginnings, middles, and ends, and we can, we can generally, so if you look at my articles, even starting, you know, back to the work that I did on coffee culture, there's certain quotes that go on for a long time where people tell these rich, amazing stories, and, and that really captures what I've heard across a number of different places when I'm doing the ethnography, but, but they capture it all in a very uh, you know, powerful and, and unique way from their own personal perspective, and yet they're speaking probably for you know, hundreds or thousands of other people when they're doing that. Mm -hmm. Just doing it in a very eloquent way. All right. Okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, in one of your recent articles, um, an article you wrote with other colleagues, um, mm -hmm. you referred to the term ethnographic sensibility. Ah. Can you explain to us what ethnographic mm. sensibility means and why that is relevant for a ethnographer? Yeah, you've d you've done your homework. That one is actually uh, it, it was in a special issue that I co-edited uh, in the Journal of Marketing Management, uh, and this was written by a couple of people. I believe one or both of them actually came from the world of industry. So they were trying to understand how social media monitoring might be used as part of the netnography toolkit. That we could, we could look using sort of a dashboard approach and then, and then maybe come up with a netnography from that. And, and you know, the, the comments that, that uh, came out of that article and, and eventually uh, shaped the, the, the future way that it was written 
um, really talk about the idea that uh, you need to be seeking some sort of deeper cultural insight or understanding when you're doing ethnography. That it's not simply about reporting what's on a surface level of actions or instances of words or particular mentions of something, that this is really about having the kind of qualitative research sensibility that allows you to dive into a unique human reality and understand it in a way that people understand other people. And that really, I think, is an ethnographic sensibility. Translated into the social media realm becomes a netnographic sensibility, if that makes sense. So, so it has a lot to do with human intelligence, human sure. intuition, human empathy? Exactly. You know, it's not, it's not about the fact that you um, can simply describe data. It's about understanding situations, uh, people, the realities that they're, just, that they're uh, representing in, in, their, in their conversations and in their representations online. I mean, the, the, the core principle behind ethnography is that, that what happens online and social media is not just uh, an exchange of text or a, you know uh, a place where content rests that this is really a cultural reality and as a cultural reality you would want to be looking for things like the the codes by which people understand their their cultural worlds the way that we can translate that in, into into broader realities it becomes very linguistic becomes very symbolic we have to understand and, and sort of uh, work through the rituals that people relate. So the work that you sometimes do at Hive that I've seen, a lot of the times you end up uh, diving deep into the rituals that people have, whether it's rituals of, of hair removal, whether it's rituals of pet grooming, whether it's uh, you know rituals of washing your car, whatever these things are, there are the, all these ritual angles. And rituals are a very rich and very universal cultural reality. So, you know, understanding an, uh, a sensibility that's cultural really is something uh, what you're after, whether what you're writing is an ethnography or an ethnography. It's, it's that deeper sense of, of uh, uh, meaning that you're trying to penetrate. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, Rob, let me go back to your book. What do you think are the most unique features of this new book? Uh, well, thank you for the question. I think it's, I think one of the things that I want people to know about uh, uh, the book is that there is a, a whole new section there which is uh, talking about the history of social media. And the reason I ended up writing that was because I was searching for a good history of social media uh, to use in the book and I really didn't think there was anything out there, surprisingly enough, that was deep enough or went that far enough. So. Uh, uh, as people will see when they read the book, uh, I go back 50 years to the beginning of the ARPANET because I think um, the beginning of network communication is really the beginning of social media. We started to call it social media, uh, you know, after Facebook and Twitter. But in reality, this uh, area of, of human activity and the way that we understand it and the way that uh, it has un been unfolding has been happening for five decades. It's 2019 now while we're doing the interview. So 50 years ago, social media really began. Uh, and I created a timeline for the book, and we have a whole historical analysis. And if people are interested in reading that, the second chapter of the book is really where a lot of that is concentrating, and it's available for free online, so people can have a look at that. So they don't even have to buy the book if they don't want to. They can read through that history of social media uh, and get a, and a, get a good taste of it. And then, you know, later on in the book, we really unpack what that means theoretically and, and how you use netnography to understand it. But I think that history of social media will be uh, really intriguing for members of the general public and general audiences to read and understand as well. That's so so uh, kind of enough about, about me talking about the book. How about if I ask you a couple questions? You, <laughs> since you are an experienced netnographer as well, how about if I turn the tables on you right here and ask you a couple questions? Is that okay? Go for it. All right, so don't worry about it. So, we'll just keep rolling. Um, so, one of the big things in netnography, obviously, is language. Uh, you know, we're very focused on the symbolic realities of people and the kind of language they use. So, I'm wondering, in you know, in your years, ten, almost ten years, right, of doing netnography, and you, all your years of experiences doing netnographies, what's some of the more interesting 
linguistic things that you've found? What kind of really interesting language have you found that people have devised and shared online? Well, there are a lot of different examples. One example would be from the NetMoms community, for example, uh -huh. and they rely on acronyms like my DS, which means my dear son or my darling son, uh -huh. my LO, which means my little one, or my DD, which means my dear daughter. Uh -huh. So they have a lot of different acronyms, and first, of course, you have to to learn them, otherwise you wouldn't be able to really interpret the whole discussions and threats in the community. So um, those are some examples. There's also one example from the long hair community. And they have, uh, for example, their acronyms to describe the length of the hair. So this is long haired people, not exactly. long haired pets. Okay. Exactly. And they have like different wordings to describe the length of the hair. Uh -huh. For example, there's um, S, uh, SL, which is shoulder length, for example or um, what was another name, um, BSL, which is brass strap length, for example, the oh. S, which is waist length, oh. and then they have different uh, different treatments, different hair care routines or yeah, methods, let's say. Uh, one example would be um, CO, which is um, conditioner, conditioning only, conditioner only, uh -huh. uh, it's a washing treatment, but only with conditioner, for example. Yeah. They have CBC, which is condition, watch, condition, but they have a lot of disabbreviations. Oh. And once you enter the community, you notice that every single or every third word is one acronym. Oh. So you really have to learn that language in order to understand uh, yeah, the different uh, discussions in the community. There's also one, uh, or there are several um, African American communities discussing oh. kinky hair, for example. Uh -huh. yeah. And they are discovered words like. Um, yeah, the creamy crack, you know what that is? The no. creamy crack? The creamy crack. <laughs> the creamy crack is actually the word to refer to relaxers. But uh, it's the creamy crack because at the end they get added to that. Uh, but they know that it's very, very damaging to their hair and to their scalp. So it's the creamy crack. So it's like cocaine for your hair. Exactly. Yeah. And then they also have like the big chop. You know what the big chop is? I don't have a lot of experience <laughs> in those hair communities. Well, the big chop is uh, actually when, this, when these uh, African American women decide to go natural, that means to get rid of the relaxers. Uh, oh. uh, they first need to get rid of their damaged hair, and that's the big chop. They chop it all off. Exactly. Huh? So they start a new journey to the natural wow. journey. But first of all, they need the big chop to get rid of the damage, completely ruined hair. Interesting. So wow. these are some examples, and there are millions of different examples. It sounds like you have a <laughs> lot of them. Because language is just so important to what we do, isn't it? I mean, and the realities that people construct uh, online have to involve these uh, the shared vocabularies as well as sort of new realities, right? Creamy crack has a whole set of connotations that that, exactly. that, that you really sort of need to understand and need to appreciate. Exactly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering a, a little bit about your, your reflections on whether computers would ever be able to understand something like a creamy crack illusion. I don't think so. Not at all. Not no. in the next 50 years, I'm, I don't think so. Um, I think they can, um, of course, interpret some sentiments, some posit positive, negative wordings sure. in the online dialogue, but really to understand the story, the feelings, the, the frustration behind being an addict of creamy crack <laughs> and finding out what the creamy crack is all about, uh, it takes some ethnographic sensibilities, mm -hmm. some human intelligence, mm -hmm. some, a lot. Yeah, so, um, I think you're right. It's a question I get a lot of. Well, when's AI going to be able to do netnography? And I'm like, well, I think it's going to be a while. Yeah. It's going to be a while. It's just it doesn't fit into that necessarily that skill set. So, so you talked about frustrations that people have. So, what about some uh, of your frustrations doing doing netnography out there in the real real world? What are what are some of the frustrations that you have, or some of the not so great stories of, of netnographies that didn't go so well? Well, um, I think one of the, the, the frustrations or the problems can be, as you know, 
perfectly know that ethnography is a very empathetic method, mm -hmm. so you really have to get physically and emotionally involved with your customer, with the with the person you're reading about. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, every time we have projects concerning, for example, diseases, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's frustrating for the researcher in the sense that he, of course, gains a lot of knowledge about the habits, problems, and feelings of patients. I can tell you one project, it was about understanding the journey of uh, patients with Crohn's disease, colitis mm -hmm. ulcerosa, yeah. and um, irritable colon syndrome. And they really have a tough time. And just reading every day uh, during weeks about um, yeah the the frustrations they have to to face every day and how yeah the bad quality but bad life quality they have. Mm -hmm. It's um it's it's a bit frustrating for you as a, as a researcher let's say because you it's you upsetting. you would like to help yeah. them and I don't know um, make changes happen as soon as possible. So um, yeah, it's and, and that's again the topic about social intelligence and uh, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, sure. human intelligence, that you're understanding exactly putting yourself in the in the shoes of this patient. Mm -hmm. So that is that is one of the the part of an ethnographer uh, who really wants needs to be very empathetic in order to really understand the whole world in this case of the patient and the consumer mm -hmm. or customer. I mean there's a long history of, of netnographies being conducted in these kind of, uh, of um, condition uh, centered social media groups or communities and uh, you know I think it's it's amazing because you think about the uses that people have put these communities to uh, and they're really finding a lot of social support from one another. They're sharing those stories because they need to. Uh, they want to reach out to other people. Some of these people don't have other people to share those stories to. And so, you know, uh, as a researcher, you're right. This is incredibly rich, uh, incredibly powerful data. But I think what's important uh, about the method is that um, it draws on us to be human beings to really empathize with this and really to appreciate the fact that people are sharing something that's very, they're very personal, uh, very meaningful to them, and often relates to, to really heartbreaking kinds of, of pain. So I think that's, I mean, I think that's a very, uh, a very wise thing to, to react to is the fact that people are sharing these things, and, and yeah. oftentimes they are painful. I mean, for me, I think one of the, one of the more frustrating things is, uh, watching people just bang each other's heads together about important issues and how hard it is for people to get along online and it kind of reminds me of how difficult it is for people to get along <laughs> in the real world as well you know that these these it, it, uh, social media really is this amazing reflection of what's happening uh, in the rest of the world and so netnography is this incredible uh, provides this incredible window on the world and That's I think true. it's so important that we come to that as human beings with our with our human intelligence as you say uh, and with our with our full uh, range of emotions and empathy and be willing to be to be open and to be even vulnerable to that in order to fully understand it and appreciate that reality. Fully agree. Yeah, that's pretty much I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> yeah, as good as any, right? So uh, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you had fun. I hope, I hope, we hope you learned a lot from monography in this incredible new book and um, yeah. Keep us reading. Thank you so much, Nelly, and thank, thank you, you everybody at Hive. Thanks.